and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to have a memorial to remember that you came in the person of your son, that you took on human form, that you died, and that you rose again for our benefit. We thank you, Lord, that in the remembrance of it, we remember that you're coming back for us as well. I pray this morning for each one of us that have been renewed by the emblems that you might speak to our minds and our hearts today, that you would help us to understand your word better, understand you better, that we might understand better what we should do. We thank you so much for the guidance your word gives. I pray that you might help every mind and every heart here today to receive the word you have for them. And help me, Lord, to speak it clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we're back in the book of Hebrews today. Chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's essentially the motivation of the writer is to make sure that these Hebrews who have come to know Jesus Christ as the Mashiach, the, their Lord and Savior, that they wouldn't be tempted to fall back into the Hebrew system. They wouldn't go back to the temple. They wouldn't necessarily go back to the sacrifices. And many of them would get their family back, their businesses back, because accepting Jesus Christ as Savior meant they were completely stricken as dead by their own people. And so this encouragement was, hang in there, guys, and remember everything that God's done in the Old Testament, and Jesus is the reality of. And he's a better person, he's a better sacrifice, he's better in every respect, and we've seen this in the past. Jesus is greater than, is essentially the whole theme of the book, that he's greater than the fathers who have come before, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than the angels, that he was made lower than the angels, and he's greater than man. Essentially, Jesus is greater than the priesthood, the temple, the sacrifice, the high priest. Jesus is better than all of that, so why would you go back to that system? I don't know about you, but uh, when I'm tempted to fall away from Christ, I'm not tempted to go to any kind of sacrificial system at all. And so for us to read through the book of Hebrews, we really have to have the eyes of the Hebrews to understand what it means. Because for me to fall away, I fall away into stupid pagan practices and uh, selfishness. So it, it doesn't speak to me about that, but it spoke to the Hebrews. And I think you need to read the book of Hebrews with Hebrew eyes or else you won't necessarily get what it's saying. And sometimes we do that. So... Going back, we looked in chapter 5 how Jesus was our high priest. He didn't go into the temple here on earth. He went into the temple in heaven. And he goes on behalf of us so that we might have salvation. We've been looking at these seven warnings in the book of Hebrews. Uh, and in chapter 5, it was that they were dull of hearing. And so we talked about be careful that we're not dull of hearing. And how do we become dull of hearing? Well, it's usually because we don't use our ears or because we overuse our ears. Like when you go to a, a crazy loud rock concert and you blow out your eardrums. How many of you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the ones of you that are going, what? What did he say? <laughs> yeah, that, that's how you can, you, you can either overuse your ears on the wrong thing or at a decibel level, which is unacceptable, or you don't use your ears at all. And so that will also ruin it if you don't use it. So we, we talked about that last time. And Jesus said that if you don't use that which is given to you, even that which you have will be taken away, which is a stern warning that if you don't respond to the things that the Lord speaks to you, then even that thing that he spoke to you is going to be taken away. Uh, and he was speaking about salvation. He was talking about accepting him as the Savior and recognizing who he was. So that warning is given to us in the book of Luke in two different places in chapter 19 and, and also chapter 8. We saw that uh, the, the writer of Hebrews kind of slams these guys because he says, though, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have become in need of milk and not solid food. So he says, you guys are, are not responding as you should. You're like a bunch of babies. And, uh, you know, there, there's nothing worse than watching a, a, a full-grown adult be babied. You, you guys know what I'm talking about? 
you know, you're 35 years old and mommy makes your bed, does your laundry, puts your laundry, you know, puts your food out for you. And you're, you're, treated, you're treated like a dependent, you know. Don't do that. Do that. Stop it. Come in. You know, go out. It's, it's a terrible thing. And, but yet they had to take care of this. And the only way to really take care of our own immaturities, what? It's to feed on the word of God, right? So that we understand the principles of what, what the Lord wants us to know. And so he kind of slammed them here. And he says, for everyone who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, maturity. That is, those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Uh, you, you don't want to see a full-grown adult in a diaper, and you certainly don't want to see a newborn chewing on a piece of steak. And so we have to grow up and come to the place where we can understand the word of God as it's written and not go away with misunderstandings or only half understandings of what it is. You discern this uh, by spending time in the word as you're able to rightly divide the word of God uh, as a, somebody who, who's a mature person. So this week we're jumping into chapter seven or chapter six and we're gonna just hit it right from the beginning. In chapter six, there's this warning not to depart from the living God. And so we've been seeing these warnings as we go through. They're warnings to the Hebrew Christians who are tempted to go back to the sacrificial system. Verse 1, therefore, leaving the discussion of elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Actually, full maturity would be a better interpretation. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. By the way, the writer says those are the elementary things. Those are the foundational things, the easy things, the simple things. I don't know about you, but people argue about all that stuff, right? And yet he says, we're going to move on from that. We're going to talk about something a bit deeper. And I hope you guys are paying attention. Verse 3, and this we will do if God permits. So he says, we're moving on from this, uh, talking about some of these elemental things, which even about the elemental things people argue, right? And he says, we're going to move on. So there, he's about to say, we're going into a deeper dive here. We're going to talk about something that's a bit stronger, and this is not something for little children to, to chew on. It's for adults. And so let's take a look at it. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. At a first reading, it appears that if you're a believer and you fall away, that you can never go back because you make a mockery of Jesus. How many of you say, yes, that seems to be the very plain writing of, of what's written here? Yeah, it's what it seems to say. So I have a question for all of you. Have any of you fallen away since you've come to Christ? Okay. Well, since the scripture cannot be broken, since the scriptures are God's absolute authority and that they are, <laughs> you're lost forever. And you're irrevocably condemned to live out eternally separated from God in a fiery torment. At first read, that's what it says. And yet, when we come to Christ, it doesn't make us sinless, does it? And every time we fall away, it's a willful thing because we know better. And in a sense, we're making a mockery of Jesus Christ every time we sin. And so this passage means that if you've come to the knowledge of the truth, if you were enlightened, if you were all of these things, that you're lost forever. Now, I can tell you this is one of the more difficult passages in the scripture because it does not jive, if I could use that word, with the rest of what scripture teaches, right? Because salvation doesn't come from you, does it? And it isn't kept by you, is it? It's given to you as a gift. And it's something when God makes a covenant to you, you'll, you'll break it a hundred times. God will always keep it. My salvation is not kept by my behavior because my behavior, quite honestly, has a lot of holes in it. So 
if it means that when I receive the knowledge of the truth and I turn away, it's impossible for me to repent. Well, then we're all lost. So what does it mean? Well, I guess one of the questions, and most of the commentators will do this, is are these believers that he's speaking to? Are these un- non-believers he's speaking to? Or are they make-believers that he's speaking to? And whether you identify these people as one of those three categories has everything with how you translate this passage. This is going to be a deep scholastic sort of thing here, guys, so forgive me. Jesus did say in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus did say that there will be people marching up to the heaven's gate thinking they're going to come right in. And he's going to say, hold it. Why should I let you in? He's going to say, well, look at all the things I did, Lord. They know the terminology. They know the Christianese. They know what to call them. Yeah, it's Christianese. There's a, you know, born again, sanctified, blood bought. You know, we have all these wonderful terms that we use on a regular basis, just roll off the tongue. But to an unbeliever, they're like, It's Christianese. (laughs) Forgive me. And so what in the world could this passage mean? Well, let's take it apart. First of all, it's impossible. Whatever it is the, the, the author is talking about, it's impossible, right? Which means... It's impossible. And yet, Mission Impossible always is possible. That just seems to happen. But... Impossible. Let's look at the context. In Hebrews 6.18, it says there are two mutual things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So it's impossible for God to lie. So that's how the word impossible is used in the very book that we're looking at. Hebrews 10.4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, which Johnny was talking about just a little bit ago. And that's in Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 11.6, But without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we know what impossible means, right? It means it's not possible. So there's no loophole there. See if we can find another loophole. Enlightened, one of the the characteristics, and there are five characteristics here of the people he's speaking to. There's five. Number one is that they're enlightened. This always accompanies the presence of God. If you see, uh, whether it's Israel in the wilderness and you see the, the pillar of light that, that guides them at night or whether it's the pillar of uh, cloud by day, the Lord guides his people and light always has to do with the presence of God, bringing light, bringing enlightenment. So, okay, these people are enlightened. So maybe they, maybe they don't know everything. Maybe the light just went on, but they're not really Christians. Well, Let's see. They tasted of the heavenly gift. In Hebrews 2.9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So this isn't just a a lick of your ice cream cone to get an idea what it tastes like, right? Because Jesus didn't just taste death. He swallowed death. Okay? And it's right in the very same book that we're looking at, so it's a good way to interpret. Tasting is not just a little tip of your tongue flavor. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by the grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you have tasted of the gift of God, it certainly sounds like these people are saved, right? These are Christians. And Romans 6, 23, I'm so quick on the trigger. And Romans 6, 23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how many of you have tasted of the heavenly gift of salvation through Jesus Christ by his grace? Amen. I'll pray for the rest of you. (laughs) Because it's hugely important that you understand that, that salvation is a gift that comes from God, and the only thing we do is receive it and believe it. Bottom line, right? So... What about being partakers of the Holy Spirit? 
Well, is it possible to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit and yet not be a Christian? Nope. Well, thank you. I have so much less to teach. <laughs> Romans 8 9 says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So the evidence of the spirit of God in your life is evidence that God has made a covenant with you. Amen? Amen. All right. Second Corinthians one twenty two, who also sealed us and has given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee that the spirit of God inside of you is a guarantee. Now, if God makes a guarantee, can you believe it? If human beings make a guarantee, eh, we'll see. But when God makes a guarantee, it's solid. In 2 Corinthians 5.5, 5, and he was prepared us for this very thing as God, who was also given us his spirit as a guarantee. It's again, uh, Paul the apostle writes to the Corinthians that the spirit is a guarantee. Ephesians 1.13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the, the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So those who have partaken of the Holy Spirit are saved, born again, blood-bought Christians. Amen? Amen? Because if you have the Spirit of God, you're his. It's evidence that you're his. Now, anybody who would fill the requirements of all of these things would be worthy not just to be a member of our church, but also to be a leader, I would think. This is evidence. In Philippians 1.6, if this were not possible, if the Spirit of God is not a guarantee, then how could Paul say, being confident of this very thing, that he has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ? I believe that's about everyone who has been a participant in receiving the Spirit of God, not just the Philippians. Amen? Amen. Okay. You guys are following along pretty well. What about tasting of the good word of God? Well, certainly unbelievers can do that, right? And the powers of the age to come. It's just a taste, and we talked about what the taste is. It's not just a lick of an ice cream cone. In, in fact, Hebrews 2, 9, for we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, and for suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Jesus came and tasted death. It's in the very same book. And so this taste is something more than what we understand as a taste. It's a, it's a complete digestion, I believe. So Jesus took the power of sin. He took disease and death. He took the power of love and the gifting of the Holy Spirit, and he gave it to us. This is what the people have tasted of, these things, the powers of what's coming, the powers of what it is to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a pretty definitive statement saying you can't lose your salvation because you didn't earn it and you don't keep it. Amen? So what in the world does this passage mean? If they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and they put him to an open shame. Let's look at the word repentance, which is metanoia. Everybody say metanoia. It, it's, it means to change your mind. Meta is change and noia is knowledge. So you're changing your mind. It's about 180 degrees going in the opposite direction. That's what repentance is, right? You guys all know what repentance is, right? Yeah. Now, the unusual thing is when you and I repent, it's we repent back to Christ, right? So we read through this passage and it just seems like all well and good and it kind of makes us shudder to think, wow, I have fallen away and I can't return into Christ because there's no room for repentance because I mock Christ all over again and so therefore I can't do it. And yet this book is talking about a repentance that you and I might not understand. I believe he's talking about repenting back to the sacrificial system, repenting back to the system of the Hebrews in which they, they would go back and say, listen, I'm sorry I received Jesus as my Savior. Uh, I was mistaken. I repent. And they go back to the temple, which is the point of the entire book. 
which fits with the context of what's being said. So if I look at this word repentance through a Christian eye, I only see it going one way. But for a Jew to repent of Christ is for him to go back to the sacrificial system, which is what the whole book is trying to say, don't do. Right? So if we read that, how does that change the way we read? Well, those who have been enlightened, who have had tasted the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Spirit, have tasted the good word of God, the powers of the age to come, if they fall away from Christ, to renew them again unto repentance, where? At the temple. Essentially, he's saying you can't go back. You cannot be renewed unto repentance, back to your people, back to your job. You're not going to get your family back. You're not going to get, you know, that form of worship back, the sacrificial system back. You're not going to get acceptance back. You can't go back. You can never go back. It's the opposite of country music. You know, <laughs> where if you take a country music record and you go backwards, you get your dog back, your girl back, your <laughs> pickup truck back, you know. You can't, you can't go back. And do you guys know how true that is? Because once the Holy Spirit comes into you and God makes a commitment to you, after you receive him by God's free gift, you receive salvation, you're a different person. And you can never go back. And it doesn't matter where you're going back. You can't repent of Christianity because you are eternally changed. And aren't you glad? Yes. Holy mackerel, so am I. So repentance is going from Christ to the sacrificial system back and being received back into the old. I mean, I wouldn't go back to my pagan practices and neither can I. If I tried to fit in with my old buddies, I will never fit in. If I tried to fit in, if, if you try to go back to whatever it is that you came out of and you try to go back and say, yeah, you know, I decided to quit all that born again stuff. I repent. Uh, yeah, good luck. You will never, ever be able to go back. You can't. You are fundamentally changed. You are a new creation. It can't happen. That's what he's saying. In fact, in 1 John 3, 9, he says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin. You can't be the same. You can't. Because God's seed remains in him. What seed is that? The Holy Spirit of God. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. You'll never be sinless this side of heaven, but you will always sin less. Can I get an amen? amen. All right, good. First John 5.18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. For the one who is born of God keeps them safe. And the one and the evil one cannot harm them. That's talking about somebody who has been partaker of the Holy Spirit. And in James 1.25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. In other words, when you hear the word of God, you have an obligation and a privilege to put it into practice. And when you do that, it shows whose nature you now have, which is God's nature because Jesus Christ has come into your life. Amen? And in James 2.12, it says, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. I don't want to be judged by the law like the Ten Commandments, like all of the other laws that says thou shalt not. I don't, I don't want to be judged by that because I'm found guilty as a sinner and without Christ I have no sacrifice that will ever be able to wash that away. We all have blood on our hands unless... And what we remembered today in the emblems was that Jesus Christ came and died for us. That's the gospel, right? So that's what it means. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have come, passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So you can never, ever go back. You can't undo. Now, there, there were times when I wished I could because I couldn't go back to my sinful behaviors. I couldn't go back to drugs. I couldn't go back to sleeping around. I couldn't go back to criminal behavior. You know, I couldn't go back. And by golly, sometimes it looked like a really good thing to do, but it was, it was a really bad idea at that moment. But I can't go back and neither can you because if you're his, you're his and you're his for the rest of your life. And you might try to, it, the Holy Spirit's like a giant rubber band that, that's wrapped around you and you can push and push and push and it just gets harder and harder and harder 
until you give up and you say, Lord, I quit, and then you're back. Can I, you guys know what I'm talking about? You guys know what I'm talking about. Amen. And aren't you glad for that? That's what it means. You can never go back. You can never be renewed unto repentance back to where you were since you crucify again the Son of God and you put him to an open shame. Every time you would go to the temple and bring a sheep, you know better. You're going to lay the sheep down. You're going to put the hands on its head and they're going to gut it right there under you. And you're going to know this means nothing. It means nothing. And you make an open shame of what God did by sending his only son as a sacrifice for your sin. You make a mockery of that when you go back to the temple. So you guys get what it means in chapter 6? Tell all your friends. <laughs> Tell all your friends. I can never go back. I've been changed completely. And if you want that kind of change, all you have to do is ask God for it and put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. So if you don't know that, you can get that. And it costs you nothing. And it costs you everything. Because he will change you from the inside out. Verse 7. For the earth which drinks the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful to those in whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. It's another one of those scary scriptures. Is he saying that if you don't bear fruit in your life, that you could go to hell and burn forever? Well, there are some pastors that will teach you that's exactly what that means. And so you better not ever make a bad decision and you better never fall into sin ever because you can't go back. And if you do, then it's like you're a bunch of thorns and thistles and you're burned up and you go to hell. And yet, all of the rest of the scripture says something completely different. So how could it possibly mean that? So how does this work? Well, if the ground, the earth, which drinks in the rain, often comes upon it and bears herbs useful to those in whom it is cultivated, receives blessing, not salvation. Because if you got salvation because you did good stuff, well, then that would make the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ by faith alone completely other. So it's not that. It's not salvation. It's blessing. You see, he's trying to encourage these Hebrew Christians, stop playing around with the old and get with the new. Jesus is better in every respect, and being tempted to go back just makes a mockery of who he is. So don't do it. You're going to miss the blessing of what it is to live the resurrected life. So it's blessing. But if it bears thorns and briars, it will be rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Okay, so I better get about doing good things or I'm going to end up burning in hell. Well, that's not what it means. And yet there are people that try to make it appear as though it says that. Here's the deal. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. So either you're in him or you're not in him. It's just that simple. And if you're in him, you're going to bear fruit. You will. And it's going to be, it, it, you know, this could go easy or this could go hard. It's like the cop tells you <laughs> when he pulls you over. <laughs> you need to get out of the car. But why? Listen, this can go easy <laughs> or this can go hard. Okay, I'm getting out, you know. You have, the, you have your license, registration, and insurance. Why? What did I do? This could go easy or this could go hard, you know. It's just like that. So... I need to examine myself, and if I don't see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control coming out of my life, I should question, do I know the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I really known by him? And do I know him? And what is this about the fire that's going to burn up? Fire? Well, you guys know what fire is all about. That's the ultimate end of the devil and his angels, right? Which ne never was made for us, this place which is referred to as hell, it was never made for us. It was made for the devil and his angels, but we decided to side with him and all of humanity is now on that side until we come to Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15, I believe this will shed some light. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, this is Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay that which was, except that which was laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, st a straw, each one's work will become clear for the day, by the way, that's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ when we will all stand before him, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. Now, he's talking about those who have the foundation of Jesus Christ who have built on their life with various materials, right? There's going to be a fire there too. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work that he is built on endures, he will receive a reward, not salvation, a reward. But if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through the fire. So you get it, our lives as, all, you know, as Christians, we have the foundation of Jesus Christ and there are things that we put into our life, you know, like endless TV watching and Netflix binge watching. And we add these things to our life. And when we go before the presence of God, those things that we've put on top of the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, if they're worthless things like that, it'll go and it gets burned up and it's gone. Will you get judged for that? No, but you're going to suffer loss. I don't know about you, but I want to have a big bag of stuff. Say, Lord, this is what I did. This is what I did with my life because you died for me and you gave me everything. So at least I could give you everything back, which is in no way a repayment, but it's, an, it's something that a thankful heart does. Yeah. You guys get it? Yeah. It's not about judgment. It's not about losing your salvation. It's about losing your benefit. It's about losing your blessings. It's about losing a reward. It's about losing time. My goodness, I look back, I'm 61 years old, and I look behind me, and I think of all the time I wasted, all the things I spent time on, and invested my money and my life in. And I know when I come before the Lord, I'm going to drag my life, and it's going to go, <laughs> so much of it will be gone. I don't want to do that and walk into eternity with that. I want to walk before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I did this for you because I love you, and because you loved me first, I could do this. And by God's power, I could jump over a wall. Man, I could do whatever whatever God calls me to do, I know that I can do. So, you understand the burned? The fire. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. So the author says, yeah, but I don't think that's going to happen to you. <laughs> so after all these spooky things that people misunderstand as judgment uh, or losing your salvation, he goes, but it's not going to happen to you. Not you good people. There are better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Because there are things that go with salvation, there are things that don't. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love in which you have shown toward his name, that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you should have the same diligence and full assurance of hope to the end. You see, that's his motive. So that you don't get lazy that you do not become sluggish. By the way, I, I, I did this in the Philippines and they didn't know what a slug was. <laughs> become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So this is a giant encouragement. You, it's not gonna be you guys, we're, we're, we're of the same mind, we're on the same, I, I don't think that's gonna happen to you guys, but I just don't want you to get sluggish in your salvation. I want you to be spurred on and encouraged. Don't get sluggish. <laughs> Don't be sluggish with your salvation. Add some diligence. And by imitation, look at those who have gone before us and say, wow, look what they did. Look how they did that. You know what? It's possible for me. If it's possible for them, if if God could speak to Abraham and Abraham could walk and he blessed Abraham regardless of all his faults and flaws and shortcomings, could he bless you? Absolutely. And if he could justify Jacob, who was the heel catcher, the deceiver, if God could bless him regardless of his behavior, could he bless you? If he can enable all of them, Isaac, I mean, if God could bless all of them, he can certainly bless you. David, who was a murderer, if God could bless him, and then he says of him that he was a man after God's own heart, could he bless you? Mm -hmm. He certainly can. 
And you don't carry your own sin because Jesus did. Amen. Don't ever forget it. So the author wants us not to become sluggish, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, he could swear by no one greater. He swore by himself, saying, surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath is confirmation to them, that an end to all dispute. You know, like you guys did this when you were a kid, right? You were trying to convince somebody you were telling the truth, the veracity of what you're saying. You say, I swear on my mother's grave. I swear to God. I swear to God on a stack of Bibles. That's silly. Anyway, so the whole swearing thing in the Old Testament had a lot of weight. And now today we understand it. Just say yes or no and mean it, right? Yeah. Take the simple life. Because if you have to constantly tell people, no, I swear, I swear, I swear. Well, so if you don't say I swear, then I don't trust a word you say. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what I'm saying. That's pretty much what you're saying. So God swore by himself. He says, I'm going to do this. He made a promise and then he made an oath afterwards about it, right? Thus, God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So not only did God promise, but he made an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled to refuge, fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that was set before us. So we have this assurance, which I know Johnny spoke to you guys about, and I'm sure that you know a bit more about now. You guys remember Johnny was that? Okay, good. I'm just checking. Wondered if you were here. It's not, you know, wishing and wanting and, and hoping. It's based upon God's promise and his oath. My salvation doesn't rest with me like, I hope so. Hey, do you know that you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. I really cross on my toes and it's none of that. God said it. I believe it. That settles it, right? So, Proverbs 18.10 says that in the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. Can you believe when God says something? I hope you can, because God said it, and he never lies. It's impossible for God to lie. So if he says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, is that the case? It absolutely is the case. And we get the opportunity to run the race and show it's true. In Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He has said and he will, will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? The scripture is very clear. When God speaks, he means it. And people listen. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. What's the hope? That God means something when he says it. Both sure and steadfast, of which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're going to get into this in the coming chapters, so I'm not going to talk to you about Melchizedek until then. But do you understand that this is an anchor that we can believe that God means what he says and we can trust him when he says it. And it's not us boasting or wishing something that, that we wish. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And it says that he enters the presence behind the veil. Now this is Hebrewism for he is the high priest that goes into the holy of holies and he's not taking his, his life in his hands because he's, he who committed no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God that presence of God, which used to be in the Holy of Holies. Jesus is the forerunner. If you'll notice, no one ever followed the high priest into the Holy of Holies, but we will one day follow Jesus, which makes Jesus our forerunner. And we have the privilege of being able to come before God's presence. And so we want to beware of departing and beware of getting sluggish in our salvation. So next week... We're going to go into chapter 7, which is Melchizedek, which has already been introduced as a, a character. So I hope that makes things clearer for you guys as to what the scripture says, how it fits into the context. 
of those who have been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and been partakers of the Holy Spirit and all of that, if they fall away, for them to be renewed unto repentance back to their old way of life, because what you'll do is you'll be making a mockery of Jesus Christ and you can't ever go back because the power of God lives inside of you and you can't ever go back. It will be a wasted life because it could go easy or it could go hard, but it's gonna go. Amen?